Neutrinos are incredibly hard things to detect. Uh, from the sun, at this moment, I think it's about 100 billion neutrinos per second is pa are passing through your little finger. Right, so it's a truly ludicrous number of these particles. If you actually want to stop one neutrino, you need about four light years of lead to have a good chance of making it stop. Yeah, so this is kind of a newsy one. Uh, it's an article just appeared in the journal Nature. Uh, where they have detected neutrinos from the sun and a rather different kind of neutrino than have been detected previously from the sun. Uh, I guess we need to back up a little bit and talk about neutrinos and where they come from. Okay, so stars like the sun are powered by nuclear fusion in their cores. What's happening in the middle of the sun is by a series of nuclear reactions, you're turning hydrogen into helium. And hydrogen is one proton, and the helium you make consists of two protons and two neutrons. And so it's not just a matter of sticking protons together, because you can't make two protons and two neutrons by just sticking protons together. You have to transmute some of those protons into neutrons. And so some of the nuclear processes has to change protons into neutrons. And that's a thing called a weak force interaction. But a byproduct of those weak interactions is you always end up throwing out a neutrino as part of the process. The fact that the sun is turning hydrogen into helium means that you have to be making neutrinos in, in the process. For a good number of years now, there have been experiments to look for solar neutrinos, and indeed we've been detecting solar neutrinos. But up until now, the only solar neutrinos that have been detected are the very high energy ones. That are, and, and it turns out the vast bulk of neutrinos are much lower energy neutrinos. The main reaction that produces neutrinos in the sun is where you take two protons, smack them together, and end up creating a thing called deuterium, which is heavy hydrogen, which is one proton and one neutron. So you can see you started with two protons, you've turned it into one proton and one neutron, so therefore you must have done one of these weak interactions, and therefore there has to be this byproduct of a neutrino. And it's sort of the first step of turning hydrogen into helium, is to take two hydrogen atoms, smack them together, create deuterium. In fact, it's sort of the rate limiting step. If you just keep smacking protons into each other, it turns out it would take you about 10 billion years of smacking them into each other to actually convince them to undergo this reaction. Um, so it's a very, very slow process, but fortunately there's an awful lot of hydrogen in the sun and the sun has a very long lifetime and therefore actually it, it, this is, you know, the fact that this is a long time scale process actually is probably what dictates the lifetime of the sun is the, the fact that this, this reaction is so slow. So you also have to create another particle, so you have to create a positron in the process. So actually the charge is conserved as well because the actual reaction is proton plus proton goes to proton and neutron in deuterium plus a positron which carries away the extra bit of charge plus a neutrino. I've always been aware that the sun is showering us with yep. neutrinos. Is it not showering us with positrons as well then? No, so positrons don't last very long because a positron will very soon meet up with an electron and then they'll annihilate and turn into a couple of gamma rays. And that's, this is, remember, this is all going on right in the core of the sun. And all of that is opaque to us because actually any positrons or gamma rays or anything else that gets created down there scatters around and takes th literally thousands of years to make its way out of the sun. Whereas neutrinos, because they interact so little with anything, once you've created them in the middle, they stream straight out of the sun. So the neutrinos we're detecting now were made very recently in the sun, whereas the rest of the energy we see from the sun has taken this long path to get out. That's the key reaction that's going on in the center of the sun. It's the thing that's creating most of the energy in the sun. But those are the neutrinos that have been previously undetectable because they're too low energy. The previous generations of neutrino detectors have not been able to detect them. And now with this new generation of neutrino detector, they're finally reaching a point where they can actually start detecting these sort of core neutrinos being produced by the sun. The ones that they were detecting, the high energy ones, where were they from? So in addition, I mean, there are lots of reactions. As I say, you have to somehow turn your protons into helium. And there's lots of, of different channels you can go, go down to actually do, make that reaction happen, some of which involve creating you know, heavier things than helium, which then split up again and so on. So there's quite a complicated set of a channels you can go down. And some of those more obscure channels produce very high energy neutrinos. So those are the ones that were being detected before. If you actually want to stop one neutrino, you need about four light years of lead to have a good chance of making it stop. Okay, they really are, because they just don't interact. They interact so weakly with matter, they'll just happily go streaming. They'll go streaming through the earth, they'll go streaming through you, through your little finger, through several light years of lead. You need an awful lot to stop them. But of course, because there's so many of them, the fact that the, in, the probability of stopping in the individual one is very low really doesn't matter. Because you know, soon, if you've got 100 billion of them passing through your little finger every second, if you think about building a nice big detector, then there'll be trillions and trillions of neutrinos going through per second. Even though the chances of any one of them interacting is very small, a few will. And so this particular detector is a, uses a, an organic scintillator. Scintillator is just something which gives out light. And what happens is a neutrino goes through, 
Very occasionally one of these neutrinos will bump into an electron as it passes through, give the electron a little bit of a kick, so suddenly the electron's got some energy, and, the, and then the nature of these scintillators is that the electron then dumps that energy into the scintillator, makes a little flash of light, and you have a whole array of photomultiplier tubes of very sensitive light detectors all around it that just look for these little flashes of light. And so they essentially detect the neutrinos by these very occasional interactions leading to these interaction in the scintillator which produces a tiny flash of light. What does it take for a neutrino electron collision to be sufficient for this to happen? Does it have to hit it smack in the face or at a certain angle or a, a, an electron that's in a certain state itself? Or? It, it really, it's just a very rare interaction. I mean, they're just, the, the, there's no particular threshold for this. It's just that the vast majority of the time, the, the neutrino and the electron take no notice of each other at all. And it's just once in a while you get close and, you know, if you like, you can think about them as a close enough collision that actually it will bump into it and dump a decent amount of energy into the electron. So it is just proximity, it is just smacking it in the face. That's it? really the way that people, th I mean, you know, you can think about them in two ways. You can think about it as a probability or you can think about the, the neutrino sort of having a cross section and if you happen to get within that cross section, it's a hit and you get an interaction. Um, but it's not, you, it's probably not right to think of the neutrino as a little hard ball in that sense. I can see how previously the high energy ones were easier to find because yep. they were more likely to shove an electron. What did they change that made it possible to find these lower energy ones? So there's a couple of things. Firstly, the particular kind of scintillator they're using is capable of actually, it will scintillate even with these lower energy interactions. And secondly, they've gone to enormous lengths to push the background down because as well as these neutrinos creating these little flashes of light, other things can create little flashes of light in your detector as well. Um, for example, if you've got cosmic rays hitting the detector, so other particles from space, nothing to do, do with neutrinos, they can cause scintillations in the detector, so they stick the whole thing a mile underground. Any radioactive material in the detector itself, in the, the body of the detector, in the scintillator, or whatever it is, then the radioactive decays of that will also create little flashes of light. So they've gone to enormous lengths. For example, um, there's a radioactive isotope of carbon that uh, decays and produces, you know, will also produce these dumps energy into the scintillator, produces flashes of light. The way they've dealt with that is they built, the, the scintillator is made of organic uh, molecules which have lots of carbon in them, so that's a bad news. So they used extremely old oil deposits to make the scintillator. So you get the carbon from very, very old oil deposits where almost all the carbon-14 has already decayed. Even with that being the case, it's still one of the dominant sources of background in this thing, it's brighter than the neutrinos are. And so it's actually quite a subtle measurement you have to make in order to dig out from all these possible sources of confusion where those neutrinos from the sun, from this basic reaction are coming from. At some level, we've got these two measures as to the, the, the luminosity of the sun, right? One is how bright the sun appears to be in the sky. And remember, as I say, it takes tens of thousands of years for that light to actually uh, get to the surface. And the other is the neutrino flux is telling us how much energy is being produced right now. So on, at least on that, we can compare the two to see whether the sun's brightness has changed on that 10, 100,000 year time scale by comparing what's going on now in the center of the sun from what was going on many tens of thousands of years ago. Um, so in that sense, it's a sort of, it is a, at least a check that the sun's sort of behaving itself on that time scale, which we've never been able to measure before. I guess it would have been a bit of a surprise if we'd found anything weird that way. And it does turn out that actually the sun seems to behave in more or less the way we'd expected it to behave. So neutrinos are like real-time sun and light is the sun thousands of years ago. Exactly. So if ever the neutrino flux stops from the sun, then we know that in you know, 30,000 years' time we're going to be in deep trouble. Oh, but it's so difficult to detect these. So the way that they tend to be detected is deep underground. So the original experiment, the first one, for example, that was there to detect neutrinos from the sun, um, was actually a big tank of cleaning fluid, carbon tetrachloride. 